first chapter. Um, but before I read that, I want to read this little small little footnote about um, Paul and the way he delivered his messages. As in all his letters, Paul followed the conventional letter format of his day, which was these three elements. Identification of the sender, identification of the recipient, and greetings. So in, in um, Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints and to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God. I thank my God every time I remember you. I keep crying right there because when I'm praying and and I get an opportunity to intercede for everyone. I thank God. And there was almost an accident in front of me yesterday. Um, I'm at the light and a car doesn't want to stay at the light. So he comes from behind me and proceeds out. Oh. Almost hitting the car that had the right of way. Well, he did. So let's finish. I thank my God every time I remember you. In my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry you until completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending the and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long how I long for all of you with the affections of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that you love, that love, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and what, what may be pure and blameless un, uh, and until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of our God. Father, to the glory and praise of who you are, Lord, we humbly submit our hearts to you. We humbly submit our wills to you as well, Father God. Lord, you have your way in us, Lord, in our teaching, Lord, and in our hearing. Help us to hear what thus saith the Lord and help us to respond accordingly. As Pastor Bird was teaching this morning on attitude, let our attitudes always reflect you, Father God, and let the teaching of the word of God come from you. Let us always remember that Jesus died on the cross for us, and let us not be so critical and judgmental when God began to open up the floodgates and send the people in. Let us always be humble servants of Christ, because with loving kindness, having Jesus drawn us all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So 
summary of what I believe God is planning to do in the earth. For members of Lord of the Harvest, this won't be necessarily new. It'll be a summary statement. But I thought it would be good to lay it out like this. I was teaching about the kingdom of God uh, at Life Challenge this week. And I tried to do the same thing with them, give them a summary statement of some of the things that I've been teaching. And I just felt that this, this would be a good time to also share this with them. So, Father, we are asking you, Lord, to come in our midst and move, Lord, by the power of your word, Lord. May we be encouraged. Father, we are looking to you and your son, Lord, to establish your kingdom in the earth, Lord, in the midst of, of many difficulties, Lord. God, we know that you are the Lord of the nations, and your kingdom endures forever. Help us to see that, walk in the reality of that, live as if that's true, and see, Lord God, your, uh, your purpose is established in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody knows that um, I teach, when I teach on the kingdom of God and its significance, I always go to Daniel 7. I'm not, we're not going to read through Daniel seven but we want to point out these characters that we see in Daniel 7 a vision that, that Daniel has a, a dream in essence that Daniel has that is, is has powerful implications for Israel's history for the gospel and for God's purposes through the church I just want to point out the main characters in this because Actually, when we go to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation bases much of its understanding of what we would call the last days on Daniel chapter 7. So in Daniel 7, the first thing we see, uh, Daniel has a vision. He sees four great beasts coming out of the sea, and that's basically verses 2 through 8. And these four beasts, of course, they represent four different human political systems, four different empires, four different world political powers. And, and the thing about these empires, empires want to have the final say in human history. They want their word to be as the word of God. They come up before the next character we see there's a, a, a throne that is set in place and the ancient of days is seated on that throne now that's that's Yahweh that's that's God in the Old Testament that's the that's the Lord that's the master of the universe the God of all creation the God of all the earth the ancient of days is both a king and a judge The Ancient of Days is both a king and a judge because in ancient times you don't have a separation between the uh, executive and the legislative branch. The king is the judge. So these beasts, these empires, are coming up before the God of all creation. And it's a courtroom setting. It's a legal setting. So they're, they're bringing legal claims before the, the judge of all the earth. And the legal claim in, in verse 8 is embodied by this mouth speaking great things. It's making legal demands. And, and the question here is, who has ultimate authority in human history? Is it any political entity? See, this is important to understand. We can look at what, what empires these four beasts represent we can look at. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And we could say, yep, they, they, they don't have authority to speak in human history. We can, we can uh, switch to modern times, and we can talk about Nazi Germany, and we can talk about Russia, and we can talk about uh, Islamic Sharia states, and we can talk about 
communist China. And everybody can agree and say, yes, and they're just like those other four beasts. They don't have the final say. But as Americans, then when it comes to America, somehow we're preempted from that. We are not. America doesn't have final say in the earth. And that's the point of Daniel 7. It's the point of, the, of the, this idea of the kingdom of God. And it's going to be the point in the book of Revelation. So this, the, the legal proceedings are established. And then the next character that we see is in 13 and 14, the son of man. The son of man, the human being. So you have political entities representing beasts. And you have a human being standing before the Lord, the ultimate human being, the Son of Man. And as I've stated many times, there's a, a contrast there. Son of Man, God has given dominion to human beings, not given dominion to political entities. Political entities are there to keep things peaceful and righteous and, and just in the earth. They're a terror to evildoers, to lawbreakers, to lawless people, but they do not have the final say. When God created the man and the woman, he said, let them, the man and the woman, have dominion over the earth. God has human beings made in his image and likeness in relationship with him, in obedience to him. They're the ones that receive the kingdom. And Jesus, as the Son of Man, which in Aramaic, means nothing more than the human being. The Son of Man, it says in verse 13, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, not the beasts. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. He's divine, right? He's a human being, but he's also divine. That's very implicit in the text here. He has to be a God-man. He's a human being, but only God can receive worship. So there's a, there's a, um, a Trinitarian implication here, even with the Son of Man coming up. And not only will he be worshiped, his dominion, his authority is an everlasting authority that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Son of man is the term Jesus used to describe himself in the Gospels. So he's making reference to this scene in Daniel 7. And he has a kingdom. It's a, a rule, a reign, the, uh, uh, an authorization to exercise authority. That's what the kingdom is. It's given to the Son of man. And then we have... We have uh, one more image that we want to see. And as we continue on, the remainder of the chapter, the Son of Man appears to be the central character, this first half. The remaining part, it's this uh, group known as the saints of the Most High God, the holy ones of the Most High God, those who are set apart for God's holy, righteous purposes. The four great beasts, verse 17 says, Daniel wanted an interpretation, so he gets an angelic interpretation. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. The Son of Man is given the kingdom. The saints then receive that kingdom from the Son of Man and they possess it. And they are the ones that help to carry out the rule and the authority and the dominion and the reign and, and the, the, the exercise of authority in human history. The church, the saints, because saints is going to be a term that we are called in the New Testament, the believers are called many different things, but saints is what they are. And again, it's a direct reference to Daniel 7. There's also uh, warfare, that, that horn, that mouth speaking great things from verse 8 and verse 21. It says, 
this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. This other figure, this horn, disputes the, the very legal judicial decision of the Ancient of Days who gives the Son of Man of the kingdom and he in turn gives that kingdom to the saints but there's a dispute and this horn wages war against the saints. Now this is really a picture of the gospel. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is, is a key term in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It refers to what's taken place here in Daniel 7. The authority that Jesus is given is to make disciples of all nations. It's to reconcile people to God, reconcile people to each other, cause people to, to be reconciled to God because of atonement, because of, of the shedding of his blood, and our faith in him, and that atonement, and we're reconciled to God, and we become reconciled to each other, and then we are sent out to establish his kingdom rule in the earth. Okay. To establish his kingdom rule in the earth means we make disciples, and disciples are basically saints of the Most High, the ones who receive and possess the kingdom. They come under the authority of God, under the authority of God's kingdom, in what they think, in what they say, in how, what they feel, in what they do, in how they do it, in their views concerning anything and everything in life. I mean, again, how we view politics, how we view spirituality, how we view justice, how we view human relationships, how we view education, how we view, view movies, television, sports, all of that is we're bringing our lives under the authority of Jesus and his word. And in doing so, we possess the kingdom. And what we do is, then we go forth and make disciples of all nations. The whole gospel is right here in, in Daniel 7. And we have a battle on our hands. Because in, in, in this idea of, of walking in God's kingdom authority, and preaching God's kingdom authority, and living God's kingdom authority, and... Uh, uh, bearing witness to God's kingdom authority. All of this, we face a battle because there's a mouth speaking great things that, that contends the authority that God has given. There's a spirit at work in the earth that is contrary to the spirit of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. And that's why the final verse of Daniel, well, the second to last verse Verse 27 of Daniel 7 says, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole of heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. See, there's the intent of the gospel. It's a kingdom. And the kingdom is something that all rulers, all peoples, all nations will ultimately learn how to worship the Son of Man, worship the Ancient of Days, and be obedient to him. Now this is what the book of Revelation is. Daniel 7 shows us that the church helps, listen to me, the church helps Jesus carry out the purposes that God began in him. We have a part. We have nothing to do with atonement, we have nothing to do with justification. We have nothing to do with grace and saving faith and all this. That's completely and totally Jesus' work. We have nothing to do with making our own kingdom or establishing our own kingdom. That's Jesus' work. But once Jesus does those works, he gives the kingdom to us, and then he says, now carry out my work in the earth until I return. Occupy until I come. And this is what the book of Revelation is. The book of Revelation is about Jesus, and the book of Revelation is about the church. It's about Jesus starts the kingdom purposes of God in the earth, and the church completes it. All the while, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, working in us and through us and with us and for us to accomplish this. 
So go to the book of Revelation now, and we're going to spend the rest of the morning in the book of Revelation. I just want you to see all the characters we have here. We have beast nations, which represents political authority in the earth. We have the Son of Man who receives the kingdom, but what receiving the kingdom, he receives dominion, which means the Son of Man is a king. So we have beasts, beast nations. We have a Son of Man who is a king. We have a kingdom that he has received from God and seeks to establish in the earth. It's given to the saints. We have the saints. And then we have warfare opposing us. And we're going to see all of that as we go through the book of Revelation. First of all, let me say, the book of Revelation is divided neatly into four sections. Four representing north, south, east, and west, the four corners of the earth. Four represents totality. There is a phrase used in the book of Revelation, in the spirit. I came to be in the spirit, or I was taken away in the spirit, and that phrase is four times in the book of Revelation, and it neatly divides the book of Revelation into four different parts. And in each place, John is somewhere, and he is taken somewhere to see something. And, and the book of Revelation can be divided easily along these lines. The first occurrence is Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, reads like this. I was in the Spirit. I came to be in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. This is the first occurrence that John says, I was in the Spirit, and it's going to cover chapters 1, 2, and 3. Verse 9 says, John was on Patmos. I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation, the what? The kingdom and the perseverance of Jesus Christ. So the kingdom is right there at the start. This is about the kingdom given to, by the Son of Man to the saints of the Most High. That's what the whole book of Revelation is about. How God works that whole thing out about establishing his rule and reign, his authority, his kingdom in the earth by Jesus and the saints. So John says, I was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Very important terms. I'm there because of the word. Every, where we go always has to be because of the word. In being submitted to the word, John ends up being in Patmos, which is commonly understood to be a penal colony, a Roman penal colony. His stand for the kingdom brought him tribulation, but also caused him to persevere, as it says in that verse, but it brought him into legal conflict with the Roman Empire. Sometimes the kingdom of God will bring us into legal conflict with our resident empires. If uh, what our, our nation states, our empires, our political entities, if what they say and do is contrary to the word of God. Normally we, are, we, we, we submit to the powers that be. That's Romans 13. God has established government. But we cannot forget, we, when, when we talk about Romans 13 submission, we can't forget about Revelation 13 beast-like interference with the kingdom of God. Romans 13 speaks of human nations and the fact that we are to submit to them. Revelation 13 speaks when those human governments become beast-like. In other words, they begin to oppose the authority of God's kingdom and they want to establish their own authority. That's, the, that's Daniel 7, 8, this, this mouth speaking great things. We take a stand for the gospel. We don't take a stand for war or violent overthrow of a government or taking matters into our own hands, but we resist it with the power of the gospel by submitting to the Lord. Paul is on Patmos because 
the word of God brought him and the church in a direct conflict with the Roman Empire. He's also there for the testimony of Jesus. He's bearing witness to Jesus. This is our job. This is how the kingdom is manifested in our lives. When we say, well, Pastor Oz, you're always talking about bringing everything in your life under the authority of Jesus. What does that mean? We come under the authority of the word of God, and we also understand that everything we do, we're bearing witness to Jesus. In other words, we're submitting to God's word, and we're living our lives in a way that is consistent with the way Jesus lived his life. You know that trite saying, what would Jesus do? Well, that's, it's trite, but it's true. That's what it means to bear witness to Jesus. So he comes to be in the spirit on the day of the Lord. Not just the Lord's day as in Sunday. The day of the Lord, according to Isaiah 2, is the day where the Lord establishes his kingdom authority in the earth. The day of the Lord is always, throughout the Old Testament prophets, where God comes down. He comes down out of heaven to the earth. He, he disrupts the earth. He unveils himself. He reveals himself. And he establishes his authority. He reminds the whole universe who's in charge. He reminds the whole universe who's the boss. That's the day of the Lord. So even right at the beginning of Revelation 1, this whole kingdom idea is there. Now, this first in the spirit is going to run from Revelation 1, Revelation 2, Revelation 3. So the first picture that we have in the book of Revelation has to do with Jesus and the church. That's where the kingdom starts, Jesus and the church. If we actually go back to verse 5 of Revelation 1, there's this, this greeting from the Father, greeting from the Spirit, and verse 5 is a greeting from Jesus, a Trinitarian greeting, and it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, Daniel 7, son of man, ruling over all the nations and kings of the earth. To him who loved us, washed us from our sins in his blood, and made us, again, a kingdom of priests to our God and his Father. So you have the king, you have the nations, and we are the kingdom of priests. We're the saints of the Most High. We're the kingdom, kingdom of priests. So when we resume back at Revelation 1.10, John hears a loud voice as of a trumpet. The trumpet is always what rallies God's people together for worship, for war, for special instructions. He hears the voice saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the churches. He lists the seven churches in Asia. Verse 12 says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, each church is a menorah, each church is a lampstand, each church bears witness, bears testimony to Christ. That's what the lampstand stood for, the menorah. It was bearing witness to the heavenly light of the Lord, which lit the inner part of the tabernacle. I see seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. See, Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is here. And of course, what the Son of Man does then is command John to speak to the seven churches. You know, I've taught a lot about the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. And what's happening? The Son of Man comes and says, Now, if you're going to be the saints of the Most High, if you're going to receive the kingdom, if you're going to possess the kingdom, then you've got to get your lives right. The temple has to be purified. And so in chapters 2 and 3, there's an evaluation of the churches. Here's what you're doing well. Keep doing it. Here's what you don't understand, you need to understand. Here's where you need to change. Here's where you need to repent. Repent where you need to. He's preparing the churches to submit to the word of God, to bear witness to Jesus, so that now they can go forth and possess the kingdom, as Daniel 7 said. Next, the next place we arrive is Revelation 4. This is the next in the spirit phrase we see. 
Revelation 4, verse 1. After these things, after Revel, uh, Revelation 1 and 10, so it's John seeing the Son of Man in the churches. Let's see what he's going to see in this next section here. After these things I look, and behold, a door was open in heaven. Open heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, another trumpet voice. Trumpet voices summon that God is going to speak. God is going to give instruction. And the voice said, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Okay, we got the Son of Man, we got the, the churches. Now what are we going to see in this second section of Revelation? Immediately I was what? In the Spirit. There's the second section. This term is going to divide Revelation, the book of Revelation, into four sections. I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So now he moves from being in Patmos, seeing the Son of Man in churches. Now he's caught up to heaven, and the first thing he sees is a throne. Right back to Daniel 7. The thrones were set up. The Ancient of Days sits. We're going to see the same kind of situation. We're going to see now God and the Lamb, a revelation of God and the Lamb, but it's the lamb who is a lion. So it's God, his spirit, seven spirits are going to be in this, and the lion who is the lamb, the lamb who is the lion. And actually, this is going to run from chapter 4 all the way till chapter 17. So chapter 4 through chapter 17 is a single entity. And one of the things that takes place, there are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls that we see in this section that runs from Revelation 4 to Revelation 17. The seals have to do with a sealed document. Watch, we're going to see that momentarily. Now, of course, I'm skipping through a lot of details to give you the overview. I'm really teaching you how to understand the book of Revelation, how to read the book of Revelation. But it is extremely relevant to where we're at now. Because if we want to understand what God is doing in the earth now, in this, this unprecedented time in human history, at least, like I say, our human history, we need to understand what's taking place is the same thing that always takes place through church history. The Son of Man is given a kingdom, and he gives that kingdom to the saints. And the saints of the Most High are going to rise up, receive it, possess it, and go forth in the power of the gospel and establish the Lord's authority in the earth and make disciples. So we're going we're to jump forward to chapter 5. And, you know, you, he, sees, he sees the throne. Uh, he sees God. He sees living creatures. He sees the, the 24 elders. There's worship going on in heaven. And then we get to chapter 5. And the one who's seated on the throne, the enthroned one, the, the ancient of days, Yahweh, God the Father, enters the scene in Revelation 5.1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a document, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now that's a legal document. So it's, we're back in Daniel 7. This was a, a legal scene where various parties were making claims and the Ancient of Days rules in favor of the Son of Man. But when you make a ruling, you put it in writing. That's what makes it legal. It's a legal document. And a legal document is sealed until it goes into effect. Somebody, if a man has a will, he writes out his will, the document is sealed with a number of seals. When the man dies, the document is unsealed, and that, that guarantees the legality of it, that it remains sealed. And now that it's being unsealed, the document is being put into effect. So in this section, from chapter 4 all the way through till chapter 17, this is about the saints receiving the inheritance of the kingdom from the Son of Man. Now it's sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, 
who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? Now, somebody's got to open it for it to be legally enacted. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, now this is the lamb who becomes the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scrolls and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Lion who is a lamb, lamb who is a lion, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. So we have the Ancient of Days. We have the Ancient of Days. We have the spirits of God. We have the lion who is a lamb. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one who sat on the throne, out of the hand of the Ancient of Days, just like Daniel 7. And when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. These are supernatural beings in heaven, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense. And now we're going to see, here they are, the saints, which are the prayers of the saints. Now we need to understand very clearly how this, the saints receiving, possessing a kingdom is clearly related to intercessory prayer. Prayer is a huge part, a huge part of establishing God's kingdom. Pastor, it's so wearisome on me. We're in this lockdown. We can't get together. We can't do anything. We can't see each other. I'm going crazy. When is this going to end? What can we do? Well, you can be locked down. You can be locked away in prison, as John was. You can be with people or not with people, but no one can stop you from interceding for God's kingdom to be established in the earth. For me, this is kind of an um, evaluation. If you want to evaluate how have I approached lockdown. Things are loosening up right now, but... They're saying there could be a second wave, third wave. There may, there may not be. We just, we, we, we trust God. We wait on God for that. But if we get locked down again, your prayer life should have increased. The, the amount of time you pray by yourself and with others, you know, you don't need to be in the same proximity to pray with each other. Praying on the phone, praying online, praying, text praying. But this is one of the things that we need to be doing. We need to see an increase in the amount of time that we pray. Because that's a key. It says, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open the, its seals. For you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And have made us again a kingdom of priests kingdom of priests. The saints are a kingdom of priests. And we shall reign on the earth. We shall exercise God's authority on the earth. And at this point, it's tied together with what? It's tied together with chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation. We reign by allowing the Lord to purify the temple. We walk in what he's called us. We repent where we need to repent and we gain understanding. At this point, there's also worship in heaven. We establish that authority by worship, and we establish that authority by intercessory prayer. Now, what, what takes place then is the seven seals are broken. The lamb breaks the seven seals. Uh, Revelation 6, verse 1, Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and... I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And the seven seals begin to be broken and the, 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 there's the release of this inheritance. Kingdom authority is released to the church as the lamb breaks the seals. Now something you need to understand, with every breaking of every seal, things get stirred up in the earth. 
See, when God comes down from heaven to the earth, it's always in the Old Testament, lightning and thunder and hail and heavy winds and, you know, the elements of the earth. Things get stirred up when God comes to the earth. We need to understand that. Do you understand that Jesus' kingdom, when it will be established in the earth, always stirs things up? because there are forces at work against his authority. We saw that in Daniel 7, this little horn, this mouth speaking great thing. There are, there are always forces at work in the earth that hinder the establishment of God's authority. So when God's authority begins to happen, things be, get, begin to get stirred up. So you have the first six seals are broken, and then I want you to go to the seventh seal. It's in chapter 8. And watch what we see when the final seal to release the complete inheritance to God's people. I want you to see what, what takes place in the seventh seal. Revelation 8.1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Without going into deep teaching about silence, and, and, and we could do that looking in the Old Testament if you're wondering sometimes, God, what the heck is going on in the world right now? What the heck is going on in my life right now? What the heck is going on in the church right now? And there's silence. There's nothing wrong with silence. It's God getting ready to release the seventh seal. Silence always precedes the powerful manifestation of God's inheritance. Because scripture says, let the whole earth be still before him. See, silence states, you and you alone understand. You and you alone are Lord. You and you alone are king. And one of the things that I, I, I would like to say about Christians is, particularly Christians who can't stop talking, learn how to shut up and submit to the Lord. That's an aspect of how the kingdom gets established. There are just times when everybody has to be still. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now the seven seals will become the seven trumpets. And another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. There are the saints again upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And we know what happens, the bowl gets tipped. The seventh seal has everything to do with the church making intercession. Whatever's going on right now, we need to establish kingdom authority by making intercession. Fast forward to chapter 11 of Revelation. Seven seals lead to seven trumpets which lead to seven bowls being poured out. In each, in each case, there's, a, there's an acceleration of judgment. And by judgment, we just mean God making the world uncomfortable so that the world will repent. The seven seals cause, a, they affect a one-fourth of the earth. The seven trumpets affect one-third of the earth. The seven bowls affect the entire earth. See, there's this acceleration. The seven seals will lead to the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets run from chapter 8 to chapter 11. And when the seventh trumpet blows, we find ourselves in Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And there occurred loud voices in heaven. And here is what Everything is moving towards seven seals, seven trumpets. Everything is moving. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ, of his Messiah, and he shall exercise his rule and reign forever and ever. It's, all, it's a kingdom issue. When God stirs up the earth, he causes the church to rise up to possess the kingdom, to receive the kingdom, to proclaim the kingdom. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord Almighty, the one who is, who was, 
because you have taken your great power and you have begun your kingdom reign. You have begun to exercise your rule. And the nations were angry, and the time of your wrath came, the time for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. The apostolic prophetic anointing comes to the saints, and the saints are characterized here by those who fear the Lord. So again, what, what do we need to be doing, Pastor? We need to fear the Lord. All right, a couple more verses, references. We'll go to the third and fourth section and conclude this. In chapter 12, we now see another figure brought in, and it's the dragon. We understand now behind the horn, behind the mouth speaking great things, behind these, these beast-like empires and nations that try to control the earth, there is a dragon. And the dragon makes war with God's people. The dragon makes war with Jesus in his birth. The dragon makes war with Michael and his angels fighting in heaven. And then when he's cast out of heaven by Michael, he comes down to the earth to make war with God's people. Again, us. See, that's that foreign force, that dark force that opposes the giving of the kingdom by the Son of Man to the saints. And verse 12, uh, verse 10 of Revelation 12 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. And the power of his Christ, the power of his Messiah have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they, he's cast down to the earth. Now John's in heaven, but the church is on earth and John's gonna come back to the earth. But we're on earth now, possessing, receiving the kingdom and the dragon has been cast down this is not a future date that we're waiting for. This, this took place when Jesus ascended to heaven. When Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven, he said, okay, devil, your place in heaven can be found no longer. The king is here. My claims have been vindicated by my dying and being raised from the dead. You're cast down to the earth. Well, guess what, guys? We're down on the earth. We're in, 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 in vacation in, in, in Acapulco, and the dragon was just cast down with us. But we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. There's that bearing witness to Jesus. There's the work that God has done through the Lamb. And here's a key. We do not love our lives to the death. We, would, we, we see that the most important thing is obedience. We need to obey the Lord. And when the Lord says, get rid of things in your life, we get rid of them. And if one day it brings us to the place where we actually lose our lives for Jesus, then that's how we overcome the devil. Do we really understand that being martyred is a victory for God against the devil? Every saint that the devil martyrs Jesus' kingdom is established because every one of them, just as they borne witness to Jesus in their lives, now bear witness to Jesus in their death by saying, you can take my life, you can threaten me with my life, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And we come to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, we see a beast rising out of the sea. It's like the fourth beast. Daniel was obsessed with the fourth beast in the book of Revelation. Who the heck is this fourth beast? Well, that fourth beast would, would be the, the, the historical empire that was there at the time of Christ, and that's the Roman Empire. So this beast rises up out of the sea in Revelation 13. The beast is empowered by the dragon, and the dragon wants to establish human authority in the earth human authority that opposes God's authority and that carries out the authority of the dragon. 
And so you have this, this dragon, and remember in Daniel 7, this, this entity, mouth speaking great things, blasphemed God and the saints. And in Revelation 13, 6, it says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him, granted to him, to make war with the saints and overcome them. Daniel 7, 25. To make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, the thing we need to understand is this is not a religious figure. The beast is clear. It's clear from Daniel 7. It is a political entity. It's an empire. It's a nation. Now, the second beast that appears in this chapter is a religious figure, the false prophet. And it's saying that the false prophet aligns itself with a political empire and disrupts God's purposes in the earth. We, we're not waiting for one end time nation for this to happen. There will be one. But we've seen iterations over and over and over throughout church history whether it was Rome of the first century or, or, the, or the, the, the Muslims of the, of the seventh century or, or, it was, or it was Nazi Germany or it was communism, it, it, whatever. There are always nations that rise up and oppose the work of the church. That's the beast. The beast, we see the beast in all these different iterations, all these different manifestations. It's no different now from what it was then. When human government seeks to have the final say in the earth, when any nation wants to have the final say in the earth, we're dealing with beast-like realities. There are righteous governments and there are unrighteous governments. Righteous governments submit to the justice and the truth that we see in God's word. Unrighteous governments oppose that. That's what this is, and we just need to understand that. Second beast is the false prophet that gives a religious dimension. Uh, one final verse, one final uh, passage in, in Revelation 14, and we'll go to the third and the fourth categories. Those are easy to uh, establish and finish up. In Revelation 14, three angels, there's a proclamation of three angels, and Revelation 14, 6 says what the first angel says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. And remember what, what chapter 4 through chapter 16 is doing. It's this establishment of the kingdom through the church inheriting the authority to rule and reign and to be God's disciples and disciple makers. And, and John is just laying out for us how this all works. And there, so these three angels make a proclamation. The first one is in verse 6 of Revelation 14. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach the gospel to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In the midst of this battle now, we've got a false prophet, we've got a beast, we've got a dragon opposing the church as the church prays, as the church worships. We're going to be given a, a, a little snapshot, a, a summary of three pictures to say, here's how it works out. The first thing is the church has to always continue to proclaim the gospel. No matter what season we're in, we need to proclaim the gospel. We need to bear witness to Christ and submit to the word. And this angel who had this eternal gospel said with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's what we're called to do, proclaim the gospel, worship God. What do we do, pastor, in this lockdown? What do we do in this civil unrest? What do we do if something else happens? We proclaim the gospel, we worship the Lord. The next angel, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her adultery. 
We haven't seen Babylon yet. yet. We're going to see her next. But there's, here's snapshot number two. Church proclaimed the gospel and church recognized Babylon is going to fall. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation. Now, please, let's understand the mark of the beast. Everybody's waiting for some, you know, let's some computer chip in somebody's forehead or hand or some vaccination that we're going to get. It's going to be the mark of the. Be I mean, all these things are, are, are people are always they've been speculating for centuries what the mark of the beast is. It's very clear what the mark of the beast is. To put a mark in your forehead, the forehead is the place of consciousness. It's the place of understanding. It's the place of thinking. And our consciousness can be determined by God, by his word, by his spirit, or we can give our consciousness over to evil political systems, false world philosophies. There are people walking around worried about the mark of the beast, looking for some literal mark of the beast. And my question would be to you, is who's controlling your mind? Does Jesus control your mind? Does the word of God shape your mind? Is the spirit shaping your mind? The high priest had, had a band right across his forehead, and it said, holiness unto the Lord. And it said that everything that the priest did, the very consciousness of his entire life, revolved around making God's people holy before the Lord. And you make God's people holy by teaching them how to worship and teaching them how to obey God. That's the consciousness that is to motivate us in the church. If any other consciousness is motivating us, guys, we've already taken the mark of the beast. That's what, what spiritual warfare is. Do you know what spiritual warfare is? Right here. Spiritual warfare is a battle in your brain. Which voice are you going to listen to? The voice of past abuse? The voice of victimization? The voice of vengeance? The voice of trying to control people? The voice of numb yourself with drugs? The voice that says, you, you just, just immerse yourself in sexual immorality? See, those are voices, and we're fighting with them all the time. Fighting with them is a sign that we're not submitting to them. Or is it we're going to submit to the voice of the Lord? And the mark in your hand, your hand speaks of your ability to do things. It's actions, it's deeds. And see, the spirit whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He puts his mark in our hands and we're free to be obedient to him and do righteousness and do truth and be disciples. We're under his kingdom authority and anyone else who tries to control us anyone, anything, any entity, any political system, any worldly philosophy, any other human being that tries to manipulate us to do their bidding, well, we've already got, we've got the mark, guys. But see, that's why we battle with these things. So we need to understand this. So now we come to the third section in the spirit, Revelation 17. Now, Babylon's been mentioned. And, and, and Babylon is going to dominate the few chapters. If we go to Revelation 17, we're going to come to section 3. And we'll finish this off quickly. 17.1. One. one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now this is a third figure. The dragon has fueled beasts, which are our, our, our governments that oppose God's kingdom authority, fuels false prophets, which can be false religions, worldly philosophies, whatever, anything that competes with our mind. It can, it, 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 it can be anything that, that takes the status of an authoritative word to us in terms of the realm of religion or philosophy. The third is going to be Babylon. She's a seductress. And let me say this, because we're not going to read through Revelation 17 and 18, but Revelation 17 and 18 describes Babylon is this socio-economic seduction of wealth. 
the socio-economic seduction of self-gratification. It's consumerism. The, the, Babylon is about, I will give you everything you want, every possession, every person, every position. I'll give you everything you want, but come and lie with me. Come lay down with me. It's, it's, the, it's the picture of the biblical prostitutes. It's that seduction of human culture. It's the seduction of the desire for wealth. It's mammon. When Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon, he's saying you either do one or the other. We serve God or we serve money. And it doesn't mean we can't make money. We're to utilize money for the kingdom, but we can't serve money. This is what, who the great harlot is. And she is a picture of a false wife. The last section of the book of Revelation is going to be the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, the true wife. And so the final images we see, we see the son of man, we're the church, we see that it, kingdom inheritance released to us, and then we see the battle between the false wife and the true wife. Which wife do we become or which wife do we take into our bedchambers, our place of intimacy? The bride of Christ, the church, or this false bride? And it says, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her adultery. So he carried me away in the spirit. There's the third, third reference to being in the spirit. And he sees Babylon. And you're carried away into the wilderness. The wilderness is the place where God takes his people after they're delivered from Egypt, but before they come into the inheritance. The wilderness is the place where God's people go when they go into exile, when God chastens them. We will confront Babylon in our human experiences of wilderness. There will always be a voice that says, come lie with me. And it's most effective on us when we are in wilderness experiences. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And it's interesting, this woman rides on the beast that we saw in, in chapter 13. The woman rides on the beast. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, see, it's, it's about foreheads, guys. Holiness unto the Lord, mark of the beast. What consciousness drives the beast? What consciousness drives this beast, the, the harlot? Mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlotry and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. There we are, brother. And the blood of those who bear witness to Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So do we understand that materialism, mammon, will always make war against the church and her witness? And it will put to death the saints who oppose it. See, that's why I always say, follow the money trail, brethren. Wherever money is the ultimate motivation, wherever money is the ultimate motivation, the great harlot is behind it. And we need to resist the great harlot. So this, this, is, this is the picture here. This, this is the picture of the great harlot. And then chapter 18, uh, we'll talk about the judgment of the great harlot, but one verse I want to point going on to the final section. Revelation 18, 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, come out of Babylon, my people. Come out of Babylon, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. Again, when Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon, he meant that those two were going to be completely antithetical. Okay, final, final, we'll close. Final in the spirit, Revelation 21. John has been on Patmos, taken to heaven, 
in the wilderness where he's seen the Son of Man, the churches, God and the Lamb, the establishment of God's kingdom through the release of seven seals, trumpets, and vials, where he's seen Babylon, the false wife, and finally he's taken up to a what? A mountain. What's on the mountain? The house of the Lord. What's on the mountain? Jesus is there to purify the house of the Lord. And Revelation 21.9 says, 21.9, I want to start. Well, actually, let's just read 21.10 because, uh, no, let's, you know what, I'm in chapter 20. No wonder it's not making sense. Let's look at 21.9. I was right. I just was in chapter 20. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, notice we have angels with seals, angels with trumpets, angels with the bowls. The angel with the seals, it's intercessory prayer. The angel with the trumpet, it's the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And now it's the angel with the seven bowls, and it's about the bride, the true wife, not the false wife. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And here's the fourth mention. And he carried me away in the Spirit. Book, the book is divided neatly into four sections. To a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Now, just so you understand who, who the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem's also the bride, go back to chapter 19 and we'll close, because 19 actually gives us a description of the bride before we understand that the bride is the fourth image in the book. We close, Revelation 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. To establish God's kingdom, Jesus isn't about materialism. Jesus gets money to give money away. That's, it's, it's a different economy. I mean, we understand we live in the economy we live in and we accumulate money and we deal with money for our needs, but money is not our controlling factor. And one of the key ways that we keep money from being our controlling factor is that we give it away. I mean, we, we use what we need for ourselves, but we give give it away in honor of God's kingdom. We give it away to establish God's kingdom in the lives of others. Again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, as the sound of almighty thundering, saying, For the Lord God Almighty exercises his kingdom authority. And here's how he exercises his kingdom authority in this fourth final section. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. The true bride, his wife, has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, not seductive clothing as the Babylon, the false wife wears, but pure clothing. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, the righteous works that the saints do. And you see the saints are all the way through here. And what I've just done is I've given you a bird's eye view of what we are called to do to establish the kingdom. This fourth section says we become the bride and we become the bride by living out righteously and performing deeds of righteousness and justice. Because remember, righteousness and justice are the same word in the New Testament. So by performing justice, performing righteousness, obeying the Lord, walking in truth, making disciples, worshiping the Lord, resisting the dragon and his minions, 
Daniel 7 gets fulfilled. We help Jesus carry out his purposes in the earth by simply becoming the people that Jesus died to create. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true saints. This is an angelic being. I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And we hear a lot of teachings on what prophecy is and what a prophet is. Here's what real prophecy is. It's not giving a personal, individual prophecy. Oh, I think the Lord told me thus and so about you. That, that is prophecy. That's the gift of prophecy. But the spirit of prophecy the spirit of prophetic and apostolic leaders is to bear witness to Jesus. And when we're teaching God's people how to bear witness to Jesus in their lives, we are moving in the real spirit of prophecy. Now in closing, and I've said this to you many times before, we need a vision of Jesus as John saw in Revelation 1. Remember the final thing, and this will be from Revelation 1, verse 20. Jesus had seven stars in his hands, the Son of Man. He said, those are the angels of the churches. The prophecies were not given to the churches. Those prophecies were not given to the seven churches. They were given to the angels of the churches. The angels of the churches are those apostolic and prophetic leaders to whom Jesus has appeared and commissioned as he did to John in Revelation 1. When he saw him, John fell at his feet as dead. And then he was commissioned to go get my house in order, get the churches in order, prepare them to possess the kingdom. Prepare them to work out the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. We need... In this hour, and this, is, this will be my final statement, what do we need in the body of Christ? We need true apostolic leaders who see Jesus, are commissioned by Jesus, and then they become the angels that set this process of discipleship in motion in the body of Christ for God's people to become the bride for God's people to work out Daniel 7. And as you can see, Daniel 7 shapes the entire purpose of the book of Revelation. We could say the book of Revelation is a midrash on Daniel 7. It's a meditation on Daniel 7. It just works out all the details for the church. We need in this hour to see Jesus. And we need men and women who see Jesus, who will rise up in real leadership in the body of Christ and will prepare the church to receive the kingdom, to possess the kingdom forever and ever. Father, I, uh, I want to um, thank you for the body of Christ. I want to thank you for your inheritance, which you have given us. You have given us an inheritance. It's the kingdom. You want us to walk in kingdom reality, Lord. May we begin to reframe our understanding of everything that's going on now, everything that may yet happen, and everything that has actually already occurred in our lives since we came to know Jesus Christ. Help us understand the centrality of the kingdom. Lord, the book of Revelation, it's really a simple outline. It says, stand in his presence. Ask him to reveal himself. Ask him to pour out his spirit. Ask him to disciple us. Ask him to, to grant us the kingdom, and we will receive it in faith, hope, and love, Father. It's not rocket science, Lord. It's not complicated. Be with your church in this hour. Lord, people are going through confusion, fear, disillusionment. People are angry with each other. There's division like we've never seen it in the body of Christ, not just over the coronavirus, but Lord, over the, 
civil unrest over what the heck is God saying, what is God doing. Send your spirit, Lord. Establish your kingdom. Raise up leaders. Let the church in this hour receive the kingdom, possess the kingdom, and partner with you in your work. Lord, help us to understand what we do and to see it in the context of, of bearing witness to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with uh, the Lord's Supper. Jan Abbott is going to share the word. I want to uh, exhort you in the Lord, sharing about the Lord's Supper is always a serious thing. We hear so much about that we need to prepare our hearts before we take the, the Lord's Supper because we're honoring the Lord. and. I don't, one of the things that, that we often hear is that we need to confess sin, we need to examine ourselves and, and see if we're holding something against another or if there's something that we need to confess before the Lord so that our hearts are ready and pure before him. But I want to take just a slightly different angle on this. Because in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the Bible says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So I want to exhort you to look for something different. So what should we look for then if we're seeing if we're in the faith? What does that mean? One of the most obvious things is looking for the fruit of the Spirit. Um, this is something that develops without even our control just as we submit and allow the Holy Spirit to be in us. Some people come to church and they get a little sip of the Spirit. So you don't see a whole lot of fruit in them. But those that are really grafted into the Spirit where their lives are receiving life from the Spirit all the time, those are the people that you're going to see fruit from. And it's not something that they're doing because an apple tree can't make an apple. It just happens because their roots go deep and they get the nourishment they need. So Galatians 5.22 gives us the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. And as Christians, those things should begin to develop in our lives automatically when we tap into the Spirit. So I want to encourage you to examine yourself to see if you see those fruits in your life. But I also want to examine something a little deeper. And we talk a lot about discipleship here but God wants to bring us deeper than just what we get in from ourselves by the Spirit and see fruit. He wants us to develop character. Character is something that, as Ozzie mentioned, we often have to go into the desert for, into the wilderness. Those are our times of trials. Just like an athlete, has to go to the gym and work out and work on strength and stamina and, and muscle building. So our spirits have to have that same type of building in order for character to be developed within us. What kind of character are we looking at though? And I went to my Thompson Chain reference and I found what the characteristics of true Christianity were, according to 
and I want to briefly go over those just to kind of give you a direction for how you're going to examine yourself this morning. And please prayerfully, as I go over these briefly, take them in because this is how we're going to see character developed within us. The first characteristic of a true Christianity, according to the Thompson Chain reference, is a new birth. We all have to start somewhere. John 3, 5 and 6, uh, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no man can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to the flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So we have a beginning point. The second characteristic of true Christianity is a growth. And 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to spend time focusing on who God is and who he is to us, our Lord. We need to grow in grace. We need knowledge, we need understanding. And you can't wa do that watching TV or uh, whatever, <laughs> any of the, but that's my sin, I guess. But we need to spend time in the word, we need to understand, and we need to grow in grace and knowledge. The third characteristic is a new dress, and that is Isaiah 61.10. I delight greatly in the Lord, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Is the Lord clothing you with righteousness? Is the Lord showing you things about yourself that need to be covered? And are you allowing him to clothe you with his righteousness? The fourth characteristic is a radiant life. Matthew 5, 16 tells us, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Characteristics. Characteristics of being a Christian. Characteristics that are going to be identified and seen. The fifth characteristic is character building. In Matthew 7, 24, the word says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. Are we building our house on a rock? Or are we building on sand? Are we putting the Lord's words to action? Are we putting them into practice? Because that's going to build character. And that's not always easy. So the Lord doesn't call us to easy. He calls us to character. The sixth characteristic is fellowship. In Luke 24, 32, we see the story of the, on the road to Emmaus when Jesus was walking with his two disciples. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So fellowship with the Lord is so important. As we study the scriptures, we need to hear from him and what he has to say. Our fellowship must be with him. The seventh characteristic is sonship. In John 1.12, it says, Yet all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Are we walking as children of God? Are we allowing God to discipline us as he does his children? Because his discipline will build character within us. The eighth characteristic is an education. John 8, 31 and 32 says, To the Jews who 
had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Hold to the truth, know the truth. Allow his word to set you free. The ninth characteristic of a Christian is service. First Timothy 6, 18 says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be ge generous and willing to share. Are we willing to serve the Lord? Are we willing to share what God gives us? And just as Ozzy alluded, he's called us to a work. And there's, it's not all about us. It's about what God is preparing us to share and to give. The tenth characteristic is a characteristic of sacrifice. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, to be, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The 11th characteristic is a walk. Colossians 2.6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. It's not about a salvation expression, and now I'm a Christian. It's our life. It's our lifetime walk. And are we walking with God day by day, moment by moment? Just as we received him, are we continuing to walk and live in him? The twelfth characteristic is a warfare. First Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Warfare is what we're called to, to do, warfare. But you can't do that if you're weak. And if you allow God to work character within you and cause you to be the warriors that he's called you to be, you'll be able to walk in warfare and fight the good fight. The 13th characteristic is the fact that there's a race. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin so easily that so in easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It's not about our plans. It's what God has marked out for us. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives, and he wants us to persevere. It is a race. And we will have number 14 characteristic, which is a victory. 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So as we walk with him, and as we see everything he has planned, we begin to see our faith grow because that is the victory. Knowing him, knowing his ways, we see victory because our faith is growing. And finally, number 15, according to my study, <laughs> an assurance of immortality. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To know him is the goal of every Christian, and it's the mark of every characteristic. To know him as we walk this walk, as we live our lives according to his plan, we find 
these characteristics will come. And I'm the first to admit that I don't have all these characteristics in my life. And that's why I want to encourage you to examine yourself, examine what God's doing in your life and what you're allowing him to do. And say, Lord, I want to have the characteristics of a Christian. I want to be who you created me to be. So as we prepare to take our communion, I want you to just quietly before the Lord, examine yourself, and then when you feel ready, then go ahead and, and take the cup. If you'll be patient with me, if I can, I'd like to sing you a song, <laughs> and I hope I can do it okay, because it's a cappella and I'm not really a soloist, so bear with me, but this is an old hymn that I heard when I was very young, and it means a lot to me. It's called In the Garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Father, we just come before you. We thank you for your presence today. We thank you for the words that we've heard from Pastor. And Lord, I thank you for allowing me to share as well. I just ask you, Lord, that you would be with each and every one here and listening, that we might examine ourselves and know that we are allowing you to build character within us, that you are doing the work that you've called us to, and that you are preparing us for what's ahead. Lord, we give you permission to take us into the wilderness if that's where we must go, to take us through the trials if that is part of the plan. For you are our joy. You are who we long for, and your fellowship is sweet. We thank you for this time, and we thank you for your fellowship. 
We bless your name and we rejoice in you. In Jesus' name. And you are all dismissed. God bless you and go with you.